Okay, let's look at this problem. Uh, this is my favorite problem in the entire textbook, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, the original version had Steve Iger pushing this uh, big old safe full of uh, gold on a uh, frictionless dolly, and the safe had a mass of 875 kilograms. The dolly, including the wheels, had a mass of 5 kilograms. There was enough static friction between the two that they didn't slip one relative to another. And Steve is pushing on the safe with enough force to cause the whole thing to accelerate at 0.4 meter per second per second. And we're asked to find that friction force between the safe and the dolly. Now, each of you, I trust, have worked this problem. So tell me which answer you've got here. How big was the friction force exerted by the safe on the dolly? Okay. Okay. Here's the thing. These numbers are very different. Two newtons you could barely feel. Uh, 7,000 newtons is going to crush you. It's going to kill you dead. This is life or death. If you got this wrong, it's not because you had a roundup error or because you sort of misunderstood. If you get this wrong, it's because you don't know how to solve dynamics problems. This is the dynamics problem. There's only one. We keep dressing it up different and making it look different. But there's only one. And so I'm going to solve this one the way you should solve every one. The first thing you do is draw a free body diagram of what? Of everything. Everything in the problem. Okay, so let's start with the free body diagram of the safe. The first force I put on that diagram is the gravitational force, the weight force, uh, the earth pulling on the safe, and that's equal to the mass, 875 uh, kilograms times G, which is 9.8, call it 10, so this will be 8,750 newtons. I then asked, are there any magnets in this problem? No. So what touches the safe? Well, there's the professor pushing with a normal force, and there's also the dolly pushing. Whenever one thing pushes on another, there will always be a normal force. There may also be a friction force. Now, in this problem, we're asked to find the friction force. So clearly, there's a friction force. But what direction do, do I draw it? Now, if you have a hard time figuring out what direction a friction force acts, use your fingers. Let your top hand represent the nooks and crannies of the safe, your bottom hand the nooks and crannies of the dolly. As the professor pushes on the safe, that's pushing the dolly along with it. If I look at the fingers on the bottom hand, those fingers are bending towards the open door. Now by third law, if the safe is pushing the dolly towards the open door, the dolly's pushing the safe the opposite direction. So I would have a friction force, it's static friction because there's no relative motion, by the dolly on the safe. Now, every time I draw a free body diagram, I get to use Newton's second law twice. Once in the y direction, once in the x direction. This acceleration 
is all in the x direction. There's none of it in the y direction. And so that means that in the y direction, my net force has to be zero. My diagram has to scream balance. And that means that this normal force is going to be 87.50. Now, I use Newton's second law in the x direction. I have two forces in the x direction. I have the normal by the professor. It's to the right, so it's positive. I have the friction force. It's to the left, so it's negative. Since this is a free body diagram of the safe, this would be the mass of the safe and the acceleration of the safe, that's going to be 875 kilograms times 0.4 meters per second every second, or 350 newtons. Now that 350 newtons is not the friction force we were looking for. It's not the push by the professor. It's the difference. But I've got one equation there with two unknowns. I can't solve that. So I go and I draw a free body diagram of the other thing in the problem, the dolly. The first force I put on there is the weight force, earth on the dolly. And that's a small force, because the dolly has a mass of 5 kilograms. And so that's going to be 5 times 10 or 50 newtons. I then ask are there any magnets? No. So what touches the dolly? The safe. Now here's where I use third law. The dolly cannot push up on the safe without the safe pushing back just as hard. I put one tick mark there, one tick mark there. Likewise, the safe cannot push, I'm sorry, the dolly cannot push back on the safe with a friction force without the safe pushing the opposite direction with a friction force. And I would put two tick marks there, two tick marks there. The only other thing touching the dolly is the floor, and it pushes with a normal force. Whenever one thing pushes on another, there will always be a normal force. There may also be a friction force. In this case, we're told that the wheels are special, no friction between the floor and the dollar. So that's our free body diagram. Once I draw a free body diagram, I get to use Newton's second law twice. Once in the y direction, once in the x direction. In the y direction, I've got no acceleration, so I have no net force. I've got two forces down, I've got one force up. This one must be 8,800 to balance these two. This one would be 8,750 by Newton's third law. Okay. Now if I use Newton's second law in the x-direction, I only have one force in the x-direction, and it happens to be the force I'm looking for, the friction force by the safe on the dolly. And since this is a free body diagram of the dolly, this is the mass of the dolly, the acceleration of the dolly, that's going to be 5 kilograms times 0.4 meters per second every second, or 2 newtons. So the answer to this problem is 2 newtons. Wait a minute, that's a huge safe. Yeah, but the professor is accelerating the safe. That friction force is just bringing the little tiny dolly along for the ride. Now if instead, the professor had tied a rope to the dolly and was pulling this along by the dolly, then the friction force bringing the safe along for the ride would be huge. But that's not what we're doing here. Now if I go back and label my other forces, if this is 2 newtons, then this force must be 2 newtons. Since the net force of the safe, the scream if you will, 
has to be 350, that means that this normal by the professor must be 352. Because when you subtract off 2, you get a net force of 350. Now I want to point something out. First of all, the minority of the class got 2 newtons. Second of all, on my multiple choice questions, I don't just make up numbers for the distractors. That 350 is the net force on the save. That 352 is the push by the professor. If you were so unfortunate as to use this formula for static friction, and that would be unfortunate because there is no formula for static friction. Did you hear me? There is no formula for static friction. Well, what's this? You left off the max. That formula is for the maximum amount of friction you can get between those surfaces before they will rip apart and start sliding. Okay? Now, if you use this, with 8750 as your normal force, you got 7,000 newtons. You got this answer. If you used this with 8800, you got the 7,040. You got this answer. So you see, every single answer was one end of a different wrong path. So if you work a problem on the exam and, and one of your choices is your answer, take no comfort. Okay, that doesn't mean you got the right answer. It just means you worked it one of the five possible ways, one of which is right. Okay, check that your neighbor got this right. If not, learn them. Learn them. <laughs> As you have been coming into my office for help, I have been finding that many of you do not believe me when I say that all dynamics problems are solved this way. You draw a free body diagram, you use Newton's second law twice, once in the y direction, once in the x direction. And you draw a free body diagram of everything in the problem. Okay? If you do that, you always get the answer. Okay? But I see a lot of people coming in with, with, with pages that don't have free body diagrams on them. Or pages that have incorrect free body diagrams. If you don't follow the recipe, you end up with a free body diagram that's incorrect, and then it doesn't matter what you do from there, because you're not going to get it right. Okay? Okay, let's move on. Sir Isaac Newton gave us the three laws of motion. He also gave us the calculus, but he's probably best known for giving us the law, the universal law of gravitation. Now, I think we have uh, all heard about the apple hitting him on the head. But this is something that may be less known. In his notes, he has this picture where he, he speculates that if you take a cannon to the top of a high mountain and fire it horizontally, the cannonball will land at the bottom of the mountain. And if you fire that cannon faster, it'll land further from the bottom of the mountain. And the faster and faster you fire it, the further it gets, until eventually the curvature of the Earth is actually helping you get further away from the, uh, from the mountain. And he postulated that you should be able to fire the cannonball so fast that it would just keep on falling and falling and falling and missing the Earth. And so what he speculated there was that things that are in orbit, for him that would be the moon, are just falling. 
falling and missing the earth. Now the question is, how fast would something have to go to get into orbit like that? Well, it turns out if you go to the North Pole and you build yourself a, a diving board so that you can dive off of. If that diving board, this is the North Pole, if that diving board is eight kilometers long, uh, or 8,000 meters, the end of the diving board is going to be five meters above the surface of the Earth. That drawing is clearly not drawn to scale. Now if I drop something, it takes one second for that object to drop five meters. We can figure that out. When I release it from rest, it has zero velocity in the y direction. After one second, it's going how fast? 9.8, let's call it 10. I don't want the slowest speed of zero or the fastest speed of 10. I take instead the average speed of five. So on average during that first second, it goes five meters each second for one second. Now, what that means is that if I fire a cannonball with a velocity of eight kilometers per second, by the time it gets to the end of your, your diving board, it will have dropped the five meters, and now it will be right here, going like that. Build yourself another diving board, and we'll just keep doing this over and over and over again, and it will just keep on missing the Earth. So that's the escape velocity. That's how fast you have to get your friend going before you can truly get rid of them. You know, a roommate. They gotta be going eight kilometers per second, and then they'll just keep missing the Earth. Okay? Now, Newton's genius was recognizing that the same force that was causing the apple to hit his head was causing the moon to fall and just keep missing the Earth. And he compared the acceleration of those two, the apple and the moon, and he found that they were very different. He found that the acceleration of the apple, shouldn't surprise us, was 9.8 meters per second every second. To find the acceleration of the moon, he had to use a formula that was given to him by Galileo. We'll talk about that formula, derive it quickly, on Friday, one of the most beautiful derivations in all of physics. But again, Newton was born the very year that Galileo died, and he built his work on the work of Galileo. And by Galileo's formula, he found that the acceleration of the moon was 9.8 meters per second squared divided by 3,600. Much, much smaller. 3,600 times smaller. Now, Newton recognized that that could also be written as 9.8 meters per second per second over 60 squared. And that number was important to him because he knew that the distance from the center of the Earth to the moon was 60 times as far as the distance from the center of the Earth to the apple. And again, he knew that thanks to Galileo. Now, what that told him was, when you're further away, this gravitational pull gets weaker. But twice as far away isn't half as strong. It goes as a square. So twice as far away would be four times weaker. Three times as far away would be nine times weaker. And if you are 60 times as far away, it would be 60 squared times weaker. Okay? That led him to this formula, uh, the universal law of gravity, where he, he said any two masses no matter what they be, 
If they're separated by a distance r, the gravitational attraction is given by this formula where that is a constant of proportionality. That is a constant of proportionality. What that means is that everything with mass is attracted to everything else with mass. Now, suppose that this had a mass of one kilogram, and suppose that this had a mass of one kilogram, and we place them one meter apart from each other. Well, this constant is just that. It's a constant. It's always the same number if we only knew what that number was. Now, to find that number, I would just take one kilogram, place it next to one kilogram, well, not next to, but one meter apart. That would be one, that would be one, that would be one squared, and the force between them would be the constant. If I could just measure how hard these two one kilogram masses were pulling on each other, I'd know that number. But the force by these two one kilogram masses is so tiny, it's almost impossible to measure. It took a hundred years for someone to measure these small forces. Where did this go? Okay. Get things back to where they belong. Now, it was Henry Cavendish who was able to do it. And this is one of the most inspirational science stories there is. I love this story. Henry studied wire, all kinds of wire, different types of metal, different thicknesses. And particularly, he studied how much it took to twist wire. If you put a certain torque on a wire, what angle would it twist through? I can almost imagine Henry coming home to his dad, and his dad saying, so Henry, tell me again, what is it you do? Well, Dad, I study wire, and I, I, I study how, how much torque it takes to twist wire. Right, right. What good is that? What does that do for anyone? Henry, get a job. <laughs> now, the reason I think it went this way is because I was in graduate school for eight years, seven and a half, eight years. And we started graduate school with two kids. We ended with three kids. And every year, I would go to huge sacrifices to take the children home to their grandparents. I mean, I did, I'm not proud of this, I participated in studies at MIT where I was the guinea pig. They pumped things into me that were unspeakable and, and did tests that I don't want to talk about. One such study, <laughs> A federal judge said that they could not feed meals ready to eat to the army for long periods of time unless it was tested. So for six months, six months, I ate nothing but meals ready to eat, all three meals, nothing else. Never a deviation for six months. And I did this to earn enough money to bring my kids home to their grandparents. And every year, never failed. My dad, so great. What is it again you study? <laughs> well, I study uh, instabilities in inhomogeneous plasmas. Right. <laughs> what good is that? <laughs> Why don't you get a job? <laughs> so anyway, what Henry did is he took one of his wires that he had spent his life studying, and he used it to support a huge dumbbell that had massive granite uh, boulders at the end. And then he brought other large granite objects nearby. And the gravitational attraction caused the dumbbell to rotate ever so slightly. You could barely, barely measure it. But Henry had spent his life measuring that. He knew exactly what that tiny little angle of deflection meant. And he was able to use that to find that constant. And he found a number that's very, very close to the one we use today. Now, let's see what we can do with that wonderful, wonderful result. If I want to know the force between my head and a book, say that's my younger head, and it's a fat head, it's four kilograms, 
And we've got this book that we used to use. This is the Cutnell and Johnson that cost $250 that we don't use anymore. If I put those two things two meters apart, Newton's law of gravity says that we can calculate the force exerted between them. Now that we know this number from Henry Cavendish, I just put in the mass of the two objects, the distance squared, and I get this number. First note that it is teeny, teeny, tiny. A newton is only a fifth of a pound. It's small to begin with. And this is 0 0.00000000002 newtons. Negligible. We're going to agree to just ignore these types of forces. But before we ignore it, before we completely disregard it, which force did I just calculate? The force exerted on the book or the force exerted on my head? Which is it? Do I have to cut this in half and give half to the book and half to the head? No. Newton's third law is built right into his law of gravity. Watch, look at that formula up there. That's the force by one on two. If you want the force by two on one, you just switch the order of M1 and M2. But three times four is the same as four times three. It's built right in to his law. So this is the force on the book and the force on the head. These are third law uh, force pairs. Now, now we can ignore them. We're only going to worry about forces where one of the objects is huge. Now, if we're looking for the force by the earth on the book, we know a fast and quick and dirty way of getting that. We take the mass of the book, we know that the earth pulls every single kilogram with a force of 9.8 newtons. So there we go, we're done. But Newton said there's another way. I can use this formula, and in order to use that formula, I need to know the radius of the earth. That's easy to calculate. Now when I say easy, I mean I can do it. Uh, back in the olden days, I used to go to Seattle during the summers. I was the director of the Summer Teaching Institute. We brought high school teachers from around the, the world. And um, one of the things that we did was measure the radius of the Earth. And the way we did it is we went out on a clear day with a two meter stick to the duck pond that was out next to the physics building. And across the duck pond, you could see Mount Rainier. So what we did is we used that uh, duck pond. If there's the duck pond, we put the meter stick there, we put an eyeball there, and we sighted along to the top of Mount Rainier. And we used simple, uh, similar triangle arguments to figure out how tall Mount Rainier is given the distance it is away from the campus. Simple. Very simple. Now, it turns out that they get an answer that is too small. And that's because it doesn't take into account the curvature of the Earth. So if they take the actual value and subtract off how much was missing, uh, the answer they got, then they could figure out this curvature and hence the radius. Okay, we're not going to do that on the exam. I'm just pointing out that if I can do it, certainly Newton could do it. Okay? Now, here's the big thing, the mass of the Earth. How do you measure the mass of the Earth? What scale are you going to put that mass on? Well, I'll tell you how do you get that mass. If I plug in to Newton's formula, there's the constant that Henry Cavendish gave us. There's the mass of the Earth, 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. There's the radius of the Earth squared. All of that stuff in the box has to multiply and divide out to 9.8. Now, as soon as Henry Cavendish measured that number, as soon as he gave us that constant, we found the mass of the Earth. 
Because we knew the radius of the Earth. The mass was just whatever it took to make that 9.8. So I imagine that the end of that story was Henry came again to his dad, and his dad said, Henry, tell me again. What is it you do? Well, Dad, today I discovered that the mass of the Earth is 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Until just now, I was the only person in all of history to know that. Now it's you and me, Dad. Have a good day. <laughs> I love that story. I love that story. Okay. Now, who's that? Does anyone know who that is? You recognize that astronaut? That is Story Musgrave, and his mass is 80 kilograms. Now, um, this is another picture of Story Musgrave out next to the space shuttle. In this picture, what is Story's mass? 80 kilograms. That never changes. What's his weight? What's his weight? He's, if you read in the paper, he's floating around weightless. Weightless. If you watch TV, he's floating weightless. His weight is 648 newtons. But wait a minute, Greg. He's floating there. His weight, his true weight, is 648 newtons. Let me explain how I got that number. If you were to look at the Earth from the moon, assuming that we actually went there and didn't fake the whole thing, <laughs> which of those circles represents the orbit of the, of the space shuttle? Yeah, the white one. We don't go very far from home. Folks, we actually have a space shuttle uh, scientist, an astronaut, in this building. Uh, a member of our faculty, Lauren Acton, was a, a mission specialist on the space shuttle. Uh, and now he, he teaches for us. And I went and I asked him, I said, how high you go? He said, well, about 400 miles, okay? So, if we use Murican units, <laughs> the radius of the Earth is about 4,000 miles. If they go another 400 miles above the surface of the Earth, they're going an extra 10% away from the center of the Earth. Now, if we look at Story Musgrave standing on a scale in his bathroom at home, the Earth's gravitational field there is 9.8 newtons for each kilogram. That gives him a weight force, a true weight, of 784 newtons. Now, if we look at him in the space shuttle, just a little bit higher a little bit further from the center of the Earth, the gravitational field is weaker out there. But not that much weaker. It's 8.1 instead of 9.8. And that's where I got the, the weight force of 648 newtons. But wait a minute, Greg. I saw him floating. Yes, he appeared to be weightless. His apparent weight was zero. And that's what we need to talk about is the difference between true weight and apparent weight. And we're going to do that with this bathroom scale. If I stand on this scale, oh my goodness. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, if I stand on that scale, I can draw a free body diagram for me. There's the earth pulling down on me. There's a scale pushing up on me. I can also draw a free body diagram for the scale. There's the Earth pulling down on the scale, not much because it's got a small mass. I'm pushing down on the scale, and the, the floor is pushing up on the scale. Now, folks, there are five forces up there. But the scale is actually only reading one of those five forces. Tell your neighbor which one it is. Which of those five forces is being read by the scale? Okay. I'll give you a hint. The scale can only read a force that acts on the scale. 
So it has to be one of these three over here. Tell your neighbor which one it is. Did you get that one there? Good. How hard do you push down on the scale is what it measures. Now by Newton's third law, this force has to always, always, always be the same magnitude as that force. Now, we give some names. This force we call the apparent weight. This gravitational force we call the true weight. This force can only be changed by diet or exercise. Believe me, if there's another way, I would have, would have tried. But the apparent weight is how hard you're pushing on the scale. And I can make that whatever I want it to be. I can change that all over the map. Okay? That's the apparent weight. Now, in summary, the apparent weight is just the reading of the bathroom scale, or it's equal to the normal force uh, of the scale pushing up on your feet. In practice, what we're going to find is the apparent weight is anything keeping you from free fall. Whatever force is keeping you from free fall. If I'm holding on to a bar, like a, a monkey bar, and my feet aren't touching the ground, it would be the tension force of the bar pulling up on me. Okay? Whatever keeps me from free fall. And it's equal to my true weight in the special case where I have no acceleration. If I stand here calmly, that number there also represents my true weight. And that's why we buy scales. Okay? But I can also get a different number by accelerating. Well, let's look at an acceleration in an elevator. First of all, let's go up in that elevator at a constant velocity. Let's say 300 meters per second, but it's a constant 300 meters per second. In that case, the forces on me, my true weight and my apparent weight, have to be the same. Now, we'll use me as an example. And my true weight is 200 and something. Let's say 230 to be polite to be uh, kind to Greg, okay, 230 pounds. Now, I wish it were news. Anyway, this would also be 230. Now, what if that elevator had an acceleration upward? Now remember, this could either be an elevator that is moving up and speeding up, or an elevator that is moving down and slowing down. You could be uh, going into the elevator at the lobby and hit the button for the 10th floor. And as you take off, this would happen. Or you could be going down to the lobby and just as you arrive, this could be happening. Either way, my true weight would be 230, but my apparent weight is going to be bigger than 230. And that's how I'm going to feel, okay? The apparent weight tells me how hard the floor is pushing up on me. Well, normally I interpret that how hard the floor is pushing up on me as how much I ate, okay? So when I'm in this situation, I feel like, oh, I shouldn't have eaten those Big Macs. Oh, man. On the other hand, when the acceleration is down, like you're arriving at the 10th floor and it's slowing down to get there, Okay, or you get in at the 10th floor and you hit the button for the lobby and the floor falls out from under you. In either of those cases, my weight would be 230, but my apparent weight would be much less. And you feel that. As that floor is falling out from under you, you feel lighter. You feel like, whoa, I could dance all night. This is great. In fact, we could make a weight loss program as long as you had people that weren't that bright, and you just say, hey, I'm gonna make you feel light. Just put them in an elevator. Give them an acceleration down. You know, it lasts for a while, and then it wears off. <laughs> then we're gonna to have to do it again, okay? Now, this is the kind of homework you have for Wednesday. You're riding down in an elevator carrying a 20 kilogram package in your arms. As the elevator gets to your floor, it slows down with an acceleration of two meters per second every second. What's the apparent weight of the package? 
with your neighbor, see if you can figure that out. In the interest of time, let's do this together. You are moving down, but what's more important is you are slowing down. So your acceleration vector is up, and it has magnitude of two meters per second every second. Now if I draw a free body diagram for the package, the first force I put on is the true force, I'm uh, sorry, the true weight, the gravitational force, and that's going to be the mass times g, uh, 20 kilograms times 9.8, call it 10 newtons for each kilogram, 200 newtons. Now, the only other force acting on this package is you pushing up with a normal force. This is equal in magnitude to the force by the package down on your arm. This is how heavy the package is going to appear to be. This is the apparent weight. Whereas this would be the true weight. Now, I know that the apparent weight has to be bigger than the true weight because this diagram has to scream up. The question is how much bigger? How loud should that scream? And that answer always comes from Newton's second law, F net equals MA. I've got a 20 kilogram package accelerating at two meters per second per second up. My diagram has to scream up by 40 newtons. That means this normal force must be 240 newtons, and that will be the apparent weight of the package. That will be how heavy it feels. Now folks, notice, I did not pull out a formula for apparent weight. There is no formula for apparent weight in the book. There is no formula on the exam. You use Newton's second law, to find the apparent weight. Now let's look at this special case where the acceleration is down and it's 9.8 meters per second per second. That's free fall. If I look at the free body diagram, how big should that normal force be if I'm in free fall? Zero, okay? See that man go up? Okay, isn't that clever? <laughs> Have any of you been on the, the Tower of Terror at, uh, at Disney World? Okay. They've got this terrible tower that's 13 stories high, and it's all spooky and everything. And you go in, and there's this uh, elevator cage that has 13 seats. And then they take you up through this haunted house and up to the 13th floor, and then they open up this door, this bay door that allows you to see Orlando, and they open up a bunch of bay doors below so you can keep seeing Orlando. And then they just drop you. And I'm here to tell you that when they drop you, you feel nothing under your seat but wet. <laughs> it's spooky. Okay. Now, you've, uh, are you weightless? No, your weight force is about to kill you. Okay, you're just apparently weightless. Now, You've all seen this movie, right? Well, folks, as uh, you can probably tell, the Aquarius isn't much bigger than a couple of telephone booths. The uh, skin of the land in some places is only as as thick as a couple of uh, layers of tin foil, and that's all that protects us from the vacuum. Okay. Now. 
The question I have is, how did they film that? Did they go to Hollywood and put them in a room and punch the button and turn off gravity? No. No, how did they do it? They put them in a plane called the Vomit Comet. Now I have a video here of some of our MSU undergrads in the Vomit Comet. And what we would experience, Zero G came closer. Not knowing what we were going to experience, some of us got nervous. But overall, everyone was excited. It was time. We were told to sit on the floor for the 10,000 foot climb. During the climb, we all experienced 2G. It felt exactly like the Gravitron at the State Fair, except after 30 seconds, the floor would fall out from underneath your body and you would float up to the ceiling, bounce off of the ceiling to a wall or the floor and just keep bouncing off things until the plane came out of the dive and started another 2G climb. This was repeated 40 times. At the very end of each flight, the pilot would simulate what it would be like to walk on the moon and on Mars. I have to admit, push-ups are a lot easier on the moon than on Earth. How many times did you vomit on the vomit comet? Three bags. Too much information. So, the vomit comet just launches itself and then goes into free fall. Just like the space shuttle is falling around the Earth and just missing it, the vomit comet is like a falling elevator. Uh, Car. Okay, we'll talk more about this. You're clearly ready to go. <laughs> we'll talk more about it on Wednesday. It's still Monday.